Okay, so I'm joined by Mr. Duncan Simmerton. Thanks for taking time to speak to us. And we're going to talk about scrotal swellings. Mm -hmm. the, main, the main, the most common ones are epididymal cysts. And that's the one that causes most concern. It's usually found opp opportunistically and not usually painful. And that brings patients to the GPs and dents to us usually. Secondary to that, I suppose epididymitis, the testicular cancer, varicoceles, hydrocele's, a whole range really, and it's important that you know how to differentially diagnose between the two, even without the benefit of an ultrasound scan. Okay, so when someone comes into clinic, what, what do you tend to see with epididymal cysts? Well, epididymal cysts, <coughs> usually it's somebody who's found something, uh, incidentally, while they've been in the chair examining themselves, uh, they're a bit worried about it. Uh, in terms of uh, examination, not, oh, the history, they're not usually painful. Uh, they may gradually increase in size, or by the time that you see them in outpatients, they've usually been two weeks waited by the GP because mm. they found a lump in their testis, so it's not usually changed. Um, they don't usually have a history of any sort of uh, surgery or trauma pre-existing to this or uh, predisposing to this. Uh, and on examination, you can feel that the cyst is separate from the testis. You can get above it uh, and uh, you can transilluminate it with a bright light source. Okay, so how do you investigate well, uh, the, the investigation to prove there isn't any intratesticular problem is an ultrasound scan of the scrotum. Uh, but I think it's important <coughs> with the patient to say, look, it's an epididymal cyst clinically. I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything wrong with your testis. We'll just confirm that that's the case to put their mind at rest before they wait for the ultrasound scan okay. and the results thereof. And what are the definitive management options? Well, um, for the vast majority of epididymal cysts, <coughs> unless, the, uh, unless they're large, they just leave them alone. You can reassure the patient that it's just one of those things. It's not going to cause them any trouble. And leave them alone. If they're a young man, the implications of surgical removal can have implications in terms of uh, fertility, uh, uh, in terms of testicular problems, infections. So it's probably best not to operate. If they're large in the way and the patient's worried about it, then by all means, uh, a quick day case general anaesthetic excision is the uh, is sure. your way ahead. They can exist in addition with in, in addition to hydrocele's as well. Sure. So you can get a double whammy. You get yeah, double, yeah. two or three pathologies within one scrotum yeah. or within one side of the scrotum. So it's important when you make a differential diagnosis not to, not to just think, oh, there can only be one, there can only be one pathology. Mm -hmm. sometimes more. Uh, for epidural cysts, uh, I just usually do a midline incision, yeah. whichever side they're on. Yeah. Uh, I warn them, this, well, not warn them, my form is going to be a general anaesthetic if they're fit. They'll have a little bit of post-operative swelling, uh, risk of a wound infection. Mm -hmm. The most important thing to mention is the 15%, 1-5% chance of recurrence of an epidural mm -hmm. cyst on that side. Okay. Uh, and not to let their GP put a needle into it to treat it by aspiration because you can convert a sterile system into an infected one and that's not good news. Okay, so shall we talk about hydrocele's? Why not? Okay. So, <laughs> so um, hydrocele's are uh, often self-referred again just with an enlarging hemiscrotum. Uh, I think the concern is often from the patient that they've got testicular cancer as their scrotum is enlarging, can be associated with other surgeries such as an inguinal or hernia uh, or, or preceding uh, problems, but usually in isolation, just a spontaneous gradual enlargement of the hemiscrotum. Okay. And what would you look for on examination? The most important differential diagnosis between a hydrocele is, is to make sure it's not an inguinal scrotal hernia. So sure. um, obviously they're roughly usually about the same size. They both transilluminate with light, but an inguinal scrotal hernia basically comes down from the groin and so there's no upper edge to the to the lesion where a hydrocele is tense and you can usually get above it at the neck of the scrotum. Sometimes you can't, sometimes a hydrocele does extend into the inguinal canal sure. and then that can be even more difficult uh, but usually the testis is impalpable. <coughs> it's surrounded by the hydrocele and it does transilluminate and the, and the light source you use to transilluminate has to be a bright one. Mm. A two-week-old pen torch in a bright clinical room is not going to do it. You need a fibre optic light source and turn the lights off or dim the lights and tell the patient before you do that what you're doing it for sure. to avoid medical legal implications. Sure. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Uh, so are there any other investigations that you would do to confirm this? Um, apart from clinical examination it has to be confirmed by an ultrasound scan because obviously um, <coughs> the patient can't fill the testis. They can be secondary to malignancy, mm. albeit rarely, so you need to find out the underlying testicle is normal. Yeah. And so an ultrasound scan of the scrotum, once again, has to be done. Okay. And the management options? 
The manager is unlike an epidural cyst, where I think there's much more of a, a freedom to say, look, it's an epidural cyst, leave it alone, conservative management. I think with the hydrocele, um, if you've proven the un- underlying testicle is normal, you really, and you, but you can't feel it, you really, you need to, if the patient's younger, you need to give them the ability to self-examine the testicles to make sure nothing does happen to that testicle coincidentally. Mm. And so I have a lower threshold of operating on hydrocele than I do with epidural cysts. Mm. Simply so you can give the patient the benefit of testing and self-examination and they can be reassured the testis is normal. Yes. In the past, GPs used to aspirate hydrocele in the surgery with the needle, take the fluid off. Yes, it provides temporary relief, but you know, almost inevitably the hydrocele comes back. So really, it's not a definitive procedure. Should we move on to varicocele? Yes. Okay. So um, varicoceles are usually present differently. I think they're often associated with pain, classically, mm. and dull aching pain at the end of the day, usually not too bad first thing in the morning when the patient's been recumbent, and then a, sensa- a sensation of a fullness above the testis, mm. often more visible in warm baths, classically, and after standing around for a long period of time. And the key, the key uh, diagnostic feature of the, the varicocele is that when the patient lies down or when you lie the patient down, it often disappears on recumbency. Sure. There's a different grading system for varicose mm. skills. One's not clinically evident. Two is disappears on recumbency. Three doesn't, okay. etc. And one of the most important things of varicose seal is to make sure that if you have an onset, acute onset of varicose seal, especially if it's on the right, then um, you need to sort of make sure there aren't any space-occupying lesions or any mm. reasons for the appearance of that varicose seal. So, so if you had a right-sided varicose seal mm. that you found on examination, would your investigations be different? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. I think any acute varicocele or any varicocele, really, you know, to do at least one renal ultrasound scan. I mean, you're going to ultrasound scan the scrotum anyway to prove your diagnosis. Sure. It's very little uh, extra to just shine the ultrasound scan further up to make sure the kidneys are okay. Mm. You feel a little bit, you know, it's a little bit, you're not doing the patient a good service if you miss a big space occupying lesion. Now, they are more common on the left than the right because mm. of the anatomy of the drainage system. But even so, I still think you are, it's, if it arrives suddenly or if, it, if they're there, you just need to ultrasound the uh, other tract. And is there any effect on fertility? <laughs> it's a very contentious issue. There are lots of paper in the literature and the jury is essentially out. Um, I think the consensus is that if you have bilateral varicoceles and you have, you have certain sperm parameters, especially motility, which is down, then a, a, a surgical fixation or surgical repair or embolization of varicoceles can improve the sperm quality. Okay. So what are the different management options? The different management options, the first one is just reassurance. Often people will come in for other scrotal lesions such as epididymal cysts mm. uh, and you'd happen to find an incidental varicocele which they didn't know was there and is asymptomatic. So you can just inform them that's what it is and you can be left alone. Secondary, uh, you can, uh, if it's symptomatic or the patient doesn't want to have the varicocele, you can then fix it, either embolization, mm. radiologic by your radiological colleagues, or surgical fixation, surgical repair. The surgical approach is going out of fashion a lot because the embolization is just as successful. 85% success rate for oncomers. 15% recurrence rate, whether you do it surgically or radiologically, but the, the big difference, of course, is that surgically uh, it's akin to a hernia repair. Mm. If you're going through the ingle region, so it's got a long six-week post-operative recovery. Okay. The radiological side of things is a puncture on the opposite side, perhaps an overnight stay or a day case procedure with very little post-op recovery problems. Mm. The way that I teach examination mm. of the scrotum is basically three questions that uh, you ask yourself. And the first one is, can you get above the lesion? So is it in the scrotum or is it inguinal scrotal? The second is, is it separate from the testis or not? And the third is, can you shine a light through it? And if you can answer all those three questions, you can do a little sort of algorithm as mm-hmm. to what the lesion is likely to be. So for a testicular cancer, obviously you can get above the lesion. It isn't separate from the testis. It's part of the testis, so it's closely related to the testis and you cannot shine a light through it. One of the common misconceptions with testicular cancer is if you have a painful lump, it can't be testis cancer. Now, if you've got a, 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 um, an invasive process eating through the body of the testis, which has got a vascular supply, and you get a small bleed into the testis, it's painful. Mm. They usually are not painful, but they can be painful. So that's a common misnomer we should we should be we'll, we'll watch out for. Um, and testicular cancer, obviously, um, the risk factors, previous surgery is always, uh, you know, undescended testes have a 10% yeah. testicular cancer rate. And 
the patients won't necessarily know they've had surgery. Um, so I always ask them if they had any surgery as a child, hernia repair is usually what they're told rather than undescended testes. Mm. Uh, and you have to look very closely when you examine the patient for very small incisions, often hidden under the pubic hairline, because they don't necessarily know they've had surgery and it's not necessarily apparent. So I think that's something okay. to look out for as well. Okay. So on examination, what would make you worried about testicular cancer? Yeah, cancers? well, there's, obviously there's two types of testicular cancer, really, aren't there? There's, there's, there's a discrete lesion within a pole of the testis, mm. which is hard, craggy, firm, and feels heavy and suspicious. And then there's the other lesion, which where the, where the, the testis is diffusely enlarged and solid and heavy and doesn't feel quite right, mm -hmm. has increased in proportion to the other side. So uh, that's really looking for looking at for both of those and the absence of any other pathology which might explain the patient's concerns. Okay. Um, and so if if someone came in breathless with a hmm. with a, um, a testicular lump, hmm. what would what would your approach be in that case? Well, it depends if they're breathless because they're worried about it, or if they're breathless because they've they've got uh, some uh, a, a mediastinal met. So essentially, if somebody's breathless, you need to examine for lymphadenopathy associated with testicular cancer. And the only place you'll find it in the average adult is in the supraclavicular fossa in the neck. Hmm. Um, a classic medical student, as you know, uh, trick question is. If somebody has testicular cancer, where do you feel for the lymph nodes? And certainly you won't feel them in the groin. That's the first people to place anyway. If the patient's particularly thin, sometimes if they've got a large retroperitoneal mass, you can feel that, but that's pretty rare. So it's usually sort of supraclavicular neck, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if they're breathless, chest x-ray, obviously, is where to go. And if you're suspicious, then you need to do a full set of markers, so alpha beta mm -hmm. protein, beta HCG, and LDH. Okay. Um, and... Obviously, there'd be some imaging as well as, sure. as an investigation. Yeah, urgent ultrasound so, scan of the testes. Yeah. And if, you, if you're absolutely clinically sure the diagnosis, you may want to do a staging CT scan as well. Right, okay. Chest, abdomen, pelvis. And That's so usually done after histological right. confirmation, but if you're absolutely sure. Okay. Yeah. And so, obviously, the the surgical option is, is, a, is an orchidectomy. Yeah. So how would you approach the orchidectomy? Well, the orchidectomy, if you if you have a serious concern that it's cancer, it has to be done as a radical orchidectomy, so the cord has to come with it. So really, it's an inguinal approach. You don't really want to go through the scrotum. Uh, so an inguinal approach, uh, usually you can split just the medial end of the uh, external oblique rather than take the whole thing out, and you can deliver most of the cord as you can. Some people believe in putting in a non-dissolvable suture on the end, so that if you're yeah. then completing the pelvic clearance, yeah, then right. you know where the you know where the cord is taken. Uh, so, um, if there's any doubt about it not being a testis cancer, what you can do is put a soft clamp on the cord, deliver the testis, have a look, and if it doesn't look suspicious, then undo the clamp and put the testis back, or just take a small biopsy. Mm. That's pretty old-fashioned. Usually, you know beforehand it's a testis cancer. And yeah. You're going to proceed proceed with your radical orchidectomy. Okay, so they have the orchidectomy, hmm. um, and then obviously, if you haven't done a staging CT preoperatively, presumably you do one postoperatively. Yeah, absolutely. To complete the staging. Yeah, and by that stage, also you have you have some idea of what the hormones are, what the uh, what the tumor markers are like. Hmm. So if you've got those very elevated AFP LDH, then then you know, it increases your uh, suspicion that they've got disease elsewhere. Okay. And, and broadly speaking, how do you categorise testicular cancer? Um, seminomas, non-seminomas, germ cell tumours, basically. Okay. Yeah. And the tumour markers might lead you towards a, yes. uh, a certain um, histological subtype. They might, so, yes. Yeah. AFP is associated with teratomas, and beta HCG with seminomas. But it's not always okay. exclusively that there are variants between, and a lot of testicular cancers don't produce any elevated mm. any of these markers. And, and some do. So. Many who have had an orchidectomy, yeah. obviously they, they may well be concerned about their ongoing fertility. So yeah. would this be likely to affect their fertility? If the other side of the, if the testis on the other side is fine, it shouldn't do. It should still be to father children. But obviously sperm banking is, is, is offered before any radical treatment for testicular cancer because of the chemotherapy implications. Okay, and obviously chemotherapy affects your sperm count. Absolutely, so. yeah. yeah. Usually temporary suppresses, it often recovers. And there's a very low percentage take up rate of the people who actually t say, uh, uh, who actually take up sperm banking and actually use it eventually, because they usually find that their sperm parameters recover. Okay. But if they don't, and you have sperm banking, 
already sorted out, then obviously that's important for the patient. And so aesthetically, obviously, yeah. these gentlemen might be concerned that they've only got a testicle on the one yeah, side, yeah. so what can we offer them? Well, um, basically, it's surprising, actually. Some older uh, males tend to not bother about the loss of one testicle. They're using a stable relationship. They're not, they're not too worried about it. But if people do feel that they like a prosthesis, then we usually put them at a later stage. You can do it at the primary surgery. I think it's better for people to get as simple pathway as possible without the prosthesis. See how they, see how they uh, feel about having one testis, and then if they do want a prosthesis at a later date, can easily put one in through the ingle approach, not scrotal approach. And the, the modern prostheses are fantastic. They're silicon, they're uh, saline filled silicon. Uh, they're soft and squishy as opposed to the hard previous ones. They can easily, easily be placed and actually have a very low complication rate. Thank you very much, Mr. Sullivan. So it's all right. Pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>